Well, I've only got two and a half hours to preach this message, so I better get started. I'm just kidding. I would never do that to you. Hey, I live in North Carolina. Have any of you ever been to my state? Okay, now let's get some things straight. There are some things that North Carolina does really well, okay? Like basketball players. Michael Jordan, to name one, okay? Uh, preachers, Billy Graham, to name one. Race car drivers, Dale Earnhardt, to name one. We're not that great at football. The Carolina Panthers are horrible. We are fantastic at barbecue. We have the best barbecue in the universe. We have the second best college basketball tradition only behind Indiana. The other thing that North Carolina has that you need to know about, North Carolina is the place where my wife and my two children live. Today, thank you for the golf clap. Today is my wedding anniversary. Can you believe how much I love y'all? I'm here with you on my wedding anniversary. What am I doing here, right? No, today is my wedding anniversary. Today, today my wife and I celebrate 14 years 14 years, two months, and 17 days. 14 years, two months, and 17 days. My wife is the godliest, loveliest, most intelligent woman, uh, best Christian I've ever met, and uh, she's a great kisser, but you'll never know. <laughs> because she's mine, my precious. Um, I have two little boys. Jacob is 10 and Jojo is seven. And one time uh, recently I was leaving to preach. My boys like to pray for me before I go and preach. My boys both know Jesus. And um, they said, Daddy, can we pray for you? And they prayed for me. And Jojo, my seven-year-old, prayed for me. He said, Dear Jesus, please anoint my daddy to preach the gospel. Please use him to save a lot of people and help him do a good job. But even if he doesn't do a good job and even if he does a bad job, remind him that I still love him no matter what. And the boys are like, I don't want one yet. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You'll get married one day, and if the Lord gives you children, he'll give you the grace to make it through. My two boys are the joy of my life. And I've been in ministry now 26 years. I, I was a 14-year-old eighth grader who thought I was a Christian because I went to church when a drug dealer at my high school was radically converted to faith in Christ, and he stopped selling drugs out of the trunk of his car and started carrying his Bible on top of his textbooks. And that was the thing that God used to bring me to faith in Christ. I knew Jesus in my head. I just didn't know Jesus in my heart. I was raised very religious. And some of you have probably been raised in church or you were raised in Sunday school or maybe you've gone to events like Momentum or some other different retreats or conferences. I was raised in three different traditions. Now, this is going to blow your mind, okay? My parents who adopted me because I, I'm adopted. I've never met my birth parents. My mom was 14 when she got pregnant with me. Praise God she did not abort me. Praise God she gave me a chance to live. I'm thankful for that. I love my birth mother, even though I've never met her. I appreciate her doing that for me. But my parents who adopted me were Southern Baptist. Then I went to a Presbyterian Christian school. Then my grandfather, who became a Christian at age 60, remarried a Pentecostal woman and started going to a Pentecostal church that I went to with him. So I was raised Baptist, Presbyterian, and Pentecostal. Talk about having a crazy, confusing, jacked up view of God and church. Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal. You know what that means, right? I was predestined to speak in tongues while eating fried chicken at a deacon's meeting. Come on, people, that's a good joke. I don't care who you are, that is funny. Thank you. So when I was 14 and the Lord saved me, uh, it, it, was a, it was a radical change. 
of direction in my life. And I want to share with you guys and with you ladies a little bit today from the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 8. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. I want to go ahead and get down to business. I know you guys have a lot going on today, and I want to be mindful of your time and respectful of your schedule. Uh, after the service, after this worship service is over, we've got a 15-minute intermission, and I will not be here this afternoon. I have uh, I run a big camp in uh, North Carolina called Crossroads. We have 4,000 students coming to our camps this summer, and we just wrapped up last night, and we turn around and start back again tomorrow. So I've got to fly home this afternoon. But during the intermission that's coming up in between this service and the next one, there'll be about 15 minutes, and directly out that door, uh, I'll be out there at my table. I've written several books. I have three of them with me today. There's a book out there called The Beauty and the Mystery. It's a seven-week devotional that my wife and I wrote together. For people that struggle having a daily quiet time, each chapter takes you about three to five minutes to read. A really great book if you really want to go deeper in your walk with the Lord. I've written a book called Surrounded by the Sacred, which is a collection of 30 stories. Each one of those stories is easy to read, very entertaining. Uh, some of them are unbelievable, like the time that I saw God raise a baby from the dead in the Himalayas, uh, like the time that I was chased by the Russian KGB in Moscow, Russia. It was not my fault. I didn't know it was illegal to climb on statues of dead Russian presidents at 2 o'clock in the morning in a Russian military park while my friends videotaped it. Um, so that book is out there, Surrounded by the Sacred, and then uh, a book called Dying to Live, which is what I want to preach on today, is out there as well. It's a book on radical discipleship and what it means to really take up your cross and follow Jesus. So I'll be out there for 15 minutes in between the next two sessions. If you buy a book, I'd love to, love to sign it for you, love to meet you. But for right now, I want to talk about what it really means to take up your cross. Because that is one of those phrases that Christians use all the time. When I was in high school, I went to a gigantic public school in South Carolina, and I played all three sports. I played baseball, basketball, and football. And on the football team, especially in the locker room, uh, the guys did not always talk about encouraging godly things. They would talk about drugs. They would talk about drinking. They would talk about sex. They would talk about all sorts of things. And I can just remember as a Christian, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, I used to sit there in the locker room and hear these guys talk about girls disrespectfully, hear these guys talk about how drunk they got or how high they got or how much sex they had on a weekend. And I used to remember them making fun of me because I didn't do those things. And I used to say to myself, well, I'm just taking up my cross. And that is kind of what that means. I can also remember in my uh, junior year of English class, I was in the AP program and I was uh, one of the few Christians in that class, and I can remember one day when the entire class circled up their desks around me. I mean, literally moved their desks in a circle around my desk, and for an entire class period, attacked my Christian worldview, attacked how, in their words, stupid, backwoods, redneck, and closed-minded I could be to believe in a virgin birth, to believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to believe in the authority of scripture. And the one thing that they really attacked me about is the fact that I was a virgin and that by the grace of God, I had made a decision to stay sexually pure until I was married. They even nicknamed me Verge, which is short for virgin. Because you know, when you're in high school, you're busy and you don't have time to have a two syllable nickname. You gotta have a one syllable nickname. And they used to call me Verge, and I can remember one guy on my football team making fun of me. He invited me to go to a party one night after, we, after our homecoming game. He's like, come on, man, I'm going to hook you up. They're going to be kegs, they're going to be bags, they're going to be girls. And man, you got, you got to come. I'm like, I'm like a man out of you tonight. I was like, nope, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I've made a commitment to stay sexually pure until I'm married. And then he made fun of me. He's like, ha, ha, I feel sorry for you. I said, why? He said, because, man, you ain't never been with a girl. You're not going to know what to do on your honeymoon night. And then all the guys laughed at me and made fun of me. I bumped into that guy about 20 years later in Walmart. Now, I don't care who you are. Walmart's got great prices every day. <laughs> I was in Walmart with my little boy, Jacob, and my wife, who was pregnant with our second son. And I bumped into that guy at the hair care aisle which I don't go to very often. <laughs> don't laugh at me, that's mean. You're hurting my feelings. So y'all think I'm bald, I'm not bald, I'm a solar powered love machine for my wife. <laughs> Booyah! I bumped into him, I was like, hey, what's up? 
what's up? He's like, Clayton, how you doing? I was like, I'm good. We had a little, we had a little talk for a few minutes. I said, hey, my, before we go, you remember what you said to me, homecoming in the locker room? Remember you invited me to a party and you said, I'm going to make a man out of you? And I said, I don't want to. And I said, you remember making fun of me? And he dropped his head. He goes, oh, yo, condo. I said, do you remember what you said about sex? Yeah, no, oh, oh, no. I was like, you told me I would not know what to do on my honeymoon night because I was a virgin. You told me I would not know what to do. Do you remember saying that to me? Yeah. I was like, I'd like you to meet my son, Jacob, and my pregnant wife, Shari. I knew exactly what to do on my honeymoon night. Ha, ha, ha. What's all that got to do with taking up your cross? Because you girls and you guys are in that stage of life right now where some of you do know Christ and you are a Christian. You gave your life to Jesus maybe even earlier this week. Some of my best friends have preached here for you guys this week. Derwin Gray is one of my closest friends. Afshin Ziafat, a good friend. Francis Chan, a friend of mine. You have had some great preachers this week who have already proclaimed the gospel to you. Some of you, your parents led you to Jesus or your pastor or your youth pastor or you got saved at an event like this. So some of you are a Christian and you're trying to figure out what does it mean to live for Christ as a teenager when everything around me is telling me to live for myself and live for the world. Others of you, now listen to me, straight up, Others of you are still playing games. You are still faking it. You are pretending to be something you are not. You are acting like you were a Christian on the outside, but on the inside, you're living a completely different life. The Bible calls that a hypocrite. Some of you are not a hypocrite because you're not even pretending to be a Christian. You don't even know if you believe it's true or not. So no, you're not a Christian. Others of you are kind of where I was. You don't know if you're going to go to heaven or hell when you die. You don't really know if Jesus is in your heart. You look at porn and you feel convicted. You cheat on a test and you feel bad. You lie to your parents and it makes you feel, you know, sick at your stomach. And you're thinking to yourself, if I was a Christian, would I really sin? And and, and Sean's already talked about that and some other people have already talked about that. And so some of you, you just don't know where you land on the spectrum. You don't know if you're in the kingdom or if you're out of the kingdom I want to cut through some of that today, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, in the next 15 or 20 minutes, I believe the Spirit of God is going to clarify some things in your minds and your hearts, and at the end of this service, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and be very clear and up front. I don't bait and switch. I'm straight up, in your face, man to man, man to woman. This is what we're going to do at the end. At the end of this service, we're going to have an invitation where Jesus is going to invite those of you who are not really saved. You're not a Christian yet. You have never really embraced the cross. And you're going to have an opportunity to give your life to Jesus, to do more than just pray a prayer. Praying the sinner's prayer is great, but that's not what saves you. Raising your hand at an invitation is cool. That doesn't save you. Standing up when a preacher asks people to come forward, that's not what makes you a Christian. Coming down to the front and standing right here at the front of these steps at the end, that will not make you a Christian by itself. Feeling convicted for your sin is not enough to save you. There is one thing that saves us. The love and the grace of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can save a sinner like you or a sinner like me. But listen, it cannot save us until we hear it, believe it, and respond to it. That was almost like God saying amen. That may have been the best thing that's ever happened to me. We have witnesses to what just happened in this house. Come on, the hair on my arms is standing up right now. That, that, like, yes, Lord, your servant is listening. So I want you to read this with me. I'm going to turn to Mark chapter 8. I'm going to go ahead and try to get down to business fast. I'm going to Skip through a lot because I want to have some time at the end for you to respond. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. I'm going to read straight through. You can follow along in your copy of the scripture. 
Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Let me pause for a moment. Jesus was not surprised when they crucified him. He knew it was coming. God did not get caught off guard when they arrested his son and hung him on a tree. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the world. Nothing surprises God. God sees everything, God knows everything. You can't sneak up on God, you can't throw God a surprise birthday party. You can't even tell God a knock-knock joke. Try it sometime, hey God, yes my child. Knock-knock, I know. (laughs) When Jesus tells his disciples that he's gonna be crucified, Peter rebukes Jesus. He says basically, no way, Jesus, you you can't be crucified because we're following you. You're our leader, and if you die, that means we fail. Peter, along with all the disciples, had left their lives, their jobs, their families, their homes to follow Christ. But one of the reasons why Peter rebuked Jesus so strongly is because Peter had a backstory. Everybody in this room's got a backstory. Some of y'all come from a broken home. Some of y'all come from a perfect home. I come from a one night stand. My wife was sexually abused by her stepdad for four and a half years from the age of six to the age of 10 and a half. Everybody's got a backstory. Everybody. Peter had a backstory. Peter came from Galilee, lived in a town called Capernaum, a town I've been to, a town that my wife and I are going back to. We're leading a trip back to Israel this year. You can go with us. We've got flyers out there on our table. Pick one up. I'd love for you to go to Israel with us. I'll take you to the town where Peter grew up if you go on this trip with us. Or if you go to Israel sometime, you'll get to go to the place where Peter grew up in a little town called Capernaum. Why is that important? Because in the northern regions of Israel, there were groups of men called Jewish zealots. And they loved Israel, and they loved the Old Testament, and they loved God, but they hated the Romans. And the Romans had invaded Israel, and the Romans had set up their form of government in the capital of Jerusalem, and all the zealots ever wanted to do was kill Romans. They hated them. They were like, they were like, I hate to even use the word because it's such a negative word, but they were almost like religious extremists or terrorists. They practiced guerrilla warfare. These these Jewish zealots would murder Roman soldiers on the streets. They would fake a fight with their friends, and when all the crowd would gather around to watch the fight, other Jewish zealots would sneak in behind, and they would have daggers in their cloaks. And when the Roman soldiers would come to break up the fight, these Jewish zealots would sneak in between the people in the crowd, pull out that double-edged dagger, and they would stab those Roman soldiers from behind, pull the dagger out, stick it right back in their cloak, and disappear. Peter had a dagger like that in the Garden of Gethsemane the night that Jesus was arrested. Because when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter pulls out his knife, and he goes to strike a man's head off, The man ducks, misses, and his ear is chopped off. Peter did not want to hear Jesus say, I've got to die. Peter's like, no, 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 wait a minute, I'm a zealot, and you are our leader. You're our military commander. You're like our undefeated general. You're like the, you know, you're like like UFC champ meets like WWE world champion meets Navy SEAL on steroids. You're you're the man we're following all the way to Jerusalem, and you're going to wipe all of these pagan Romans out of our nation and cleanse it and get it ready for the new temple. So Peter didn't want to hear Jesus say, I've got to be crucified, so he rebukes Jesus. Then Jesus rebukes Peter and says in verse 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. I spent about a year 
doing some research on the historical context of this passage of Scripture, along with some other ones like John chapter 11, when Jesus is about to go back to Bethany and raise Lazarus from the dead, and Thomas, doubting Thomas, says, let's go with Jesus so we can die with him. And I was fascinated by what it meant to really take up your cross. And so I, I traveled to Israel. My wife and I went to the Holy Land. I read some books. I did some research. And I found out some things in researching for this book, Dying to Live, that I wrote that blew my mind. And I've been preaching this message ever since. And I want you girls and I want you guys to hear this. There's something going on here in Mark chapter 8. There's something really important going on here beneath the surface that a lot of us don't see. And I want to show you what's happening here. People had been following Jesus because he was pretty much a rock star. Jesus showed up on the scene after he was baptized by his cousin John the Baptist and after he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the desert being tempted by Satan. Then Jesus shows up and starts calling disciples. Then he starts performing miracles. Then by the time he gets to Jerusalem, people are losing their minds. They're going nuts about Jesus. They've heard that he can raise the dead. They've heard he can turn water to wine. They've heard he can cast demons into pigs. They've heard he can curse trees and make them die. They've heard he can walk across the top of water and he can calm storms. There was a buzz about Jesus. And so all of the common blue-collar Jewish people were thinking, this is it. He's the Messiah. He's the military leader that's come to destroy the Romans and rid them, get them out of our country. The Pharisees and the religious leaders didn't like Jesus because they thought Jesus was going to be more powerful and more popular than them. So they began to plot how they would kill Jesus. So people are following Jesus because he's healing sick people, he's raising dead people, and he's feeding hungry people. So in Mark chapter 8, the crowds are huge. And Jesus gathers the crowds to him, and it's almost like this is the moment in the Gospel of Mark when the whole story shifts. This is the moment where, like, everything changes. Jesus goes from being a really popular rock star that everybody loves to we're not really sure if this guy's legit or not. And it all happens when he says, hey, guys, from now on, look, I know some of y'all are following me because I give you good stuff and I feed your hungry relatives and I heal your sick friends. But there's more to me than that. If you really want to follow me, if you really want to be my disciple, if I could use our terminology today, if you really want to be a Christian, if you really want to have a relationship with Jesus, if you really want to belong to Christ, if you really want to be in his kingdom, a part of his family, Jesus does not promise you an easy life or a happy ending or that all of your prayers will be answered. He really actually promises the opposite. He says in Mark 8, from now on, if any of you want to really follow me, this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to deny yourself and take up your cross. Those four words have a, a backstory, and that's where I want to spend the next seven or eight minutes with you. When those zealots like Peter would get together and talk, they would plan how to kill the Romans, but guess what? There were lots of zealots waiting on a Messiah. They thought Jesus was the Messiah, but he wasn't the first one. There had been multiple Jewish guys who would show up during, throughout the years and say, hey, I'm the promised one. I'm the, I'm the one the prophet spoke about. Follow me. We'll kill all the Romans and we'll rebuild the kingdom of God and we'll rebuild the temple of Solomon and David right in the heart of Jerusalem. And every one of those guys that would say they were the Messiahs, they'd all end up flopping because they weren't really the Messiah. So these zealots were so anxious to find a military leader. When Jesus was a little boy, we don't know exactly what year this happened. The, uh, the world-renowned historian Will Durant puts it somewhere about the time that Jesus was between the ages of 5 and 10. So sometime when Jesus was between the ages of 5 and 10, there was a guy from Galilee, the same place that Peter and Andrew and a majority of the disciples came from. There was a guy from Galilee. And if you want to read, he's referenced one time in the New Testament. It's in Acts chapter 5, verse 37. He's called Judas the Galilean. 
He's mentioned one time in the Bible, but history records Josephus, the historian, wrote about this guy. Judas the Galilean claimed to be the Messiah. And he recruited, get this, this, this blows my mind. He recruited thousands of zealots to follow him. And he convinced them he was like God in the flesh. And this is the plan they came up with. Judas the Galilean, had, he was a cult leader essentially. He had convinced them that he was bulletproof, that he could not be killed, that if they would follow him and march into Jerusalem, they would kill all the Romans, they would rid the Holy Land of all these Gentiles. And so about 2,000 of these guys, most of them farmers and fishermen from Galilee, who were not trained in war, who did not know how to fight battle, they followed him all the way to Jerusalem. And when Jesus was a, a little boy, probably around the same time that some of his disciples were little boys, Judas the Galilean leads somewhere around 2,000 men into Jerusalem, and they begin to systematically attack Roman soldiers. The Roman soldiers were like the police officers of Jerusalem, and their job was to keep the peace. And so these Jewish zealots start killing Romans. It didn't take long, though, for the Roman soldiers to figure out what was going on, and so they defended themselves. They killed probably about 500 to 1,000 of those zealots, but this is where the story gets absolutely mind-boggling. They decided not to kill all 2,000 of the zealots. They decided to take the remaining uh, survivors and use them as billboards for propaganda. Just like when you're riding down the interstate and you see a billboard for McDonald's or a billboard for Starbucks or a billboard for a gas station, the Romans invented propaganda and they knew the best way to keep Rome's power was to intimidate its subjects. The Jews were subjects of the Romans. So you know what the Romans did? They issued an edict and they began to crucify those zealots on crosses all throughout the city of Jerusalem. But they didn't just crucify them. They made them carry their own cross. So they captured all the remaining zealots who survived. They tied their hands up. They went and they got crosses, pieces of wood that they recycled. See, they didn't make a new cross for every criminal they killed. They used the recycled crosses, the ones that were covered with blood and flesh and skin and intestines and hair from the previous victims who had been crucified on them. And so two Roman soldiers would take one Jewish zealot, they would bring a cross to them, or in many cases the cross beam, just that part where the hands would be nailed, and they would say four words. Josephus records this, other historians reference this. They would look at the cross and they would tell that zealot, take up your cross. And the zealot would pick up the cross and carry it, or he would drag it to a prearranged place. And then those two Roman soldiers who were kind of like a security detail, when they found a suitable place with a lot of traffic, with a lot of people, a marketplace, an intersection near the temple, along the streets of Jerusalem, when they found a place that was a high traffic location where they knew a lot of people would witness the crucifixion, they would say, lay down your cross. And then that Jewish zealot would lay down his cross. Then he would climb on the cross. Then they would tie ropes around his forearms and around his shins and his calves to keep the arms and the legs still while they were driving nine-inch long railroad spikes into the hands and the feet of those zealots. Then once the nails were driven through the flesh into the wood, they would lift up the cross. They would place it in a hole, or in some cases they would they would lift up just that cross beam and then they would nail the cross beam to an olive tree and they would crucify them on olive trees along the sides of the road. And they also issued in that same edict a rule that you were not allowed to take down those bodies after those men died. So for the first two or three days, there were a thousand men hanging on crosses along the streets of Jerusalem screaming for mercy, begging for a drink of water, begging for someone to smother them, strangle them, break their legs, cut their throat, because that kind of pain made people beg for mercy. But if you were related to one of them, you couldn't take them down, you couldn't end their misery, you could not go anywhere in Jerusalem without seeing one of those men hanging on crosses. After four or five days, all those men are dead, 
but you still couldn't take their bodies down because Rome was trying to make a point. Rome was saying, we're in charge, not you. You do what we say. Don't rebel against us. We're the boss. So those men's bodies hung on those crosses. Do you know that there are historical mentions of those crosses with bone fragments and skeletons still hanging on them a hundred years after Jesus was raised from the dead? Now, back to Mark 8, 34. Jesus says, 25 or 30 years after the rebellion, 25 or 30 years after Judas the Galilean is crucified on a cross along with a thousand of his zealot followers, 25 or 30 years after those men are lined up along the roads in the holy city, Jesus says, I know y'all are following me because of the free food and the free show, but I didn't come to just fill your belly, I came to save your soul. I didn't come to entertain you, I came to redeem you. I didn't come to condemn you, I came to love you and save you. And Jesus says, so if you wanna follow me, it's gonna cost you something. And then I can't prove this, I mean, I I wasn't there, so I don't know, but Jesus was a master communicator. He was really good at his craft. It wouldn't surprise me to find out one day, maybe when we get to heaven, that when Jesus is teaching this crowd of people in Mark chapter eight, what it means to follow Christ, what it means to belong to Jesus, what it means to be a true disciple. Wouldn't it be amazing to find out when we get to heaven that Jesus is teaching and when he says to everybody there, if y'all wanna follow me, if you want to be my disciple, you're gonna have to deny yourself and take up your cross. What if he's pointing to one of those crosses with skeleton pieces still hanging on it? Everybody knew what that phrase meant. To say take up your cross back then would be like me saying leukemia, cancer, AIDS, 9-11. It's not real happy. It's not real fun. But Jesus knew that following him was a big decision. Guys, when I was 14, I was an eighth grader, the grace of God wrecked and ruined my life. I was a religious kid who was faking it. I was going to Sunday school where my dad was my teacher. I was going to Christian school five days a week and making straight A's in Bible class. I had memorized 500 Bible verses and catechisms before I started middle school. I had an outer appearance of religiosity But on the inside of my heart, I wasn't following Jesus. I didn't know Christ. I was going through the motions. I just didn't want to go to hell. That's it. I'm being honest with you. I wanted to go to heaven when I died, but I wanted to live my life while I was here on this earth. And then it hit me. Jesus doesn't just want decisions. Jesus wants disciples. And so I had made all these decisions as a kid. I I got, quote unquote, I got saved when I was seven just because I wanted to get baptized and be able to take communion in the Baptist church my parents went to, but I didn't really become a Christian. I had Jesus in my head, but not in my heart. And then probably a dozen, maybe two dozen times after that, I would feel convicted for my sin and I would lay in my bed at night wondering if I died, if I would go to hell. This is back when Russia was our big nuclear enemy and and I used to live in the fear of what happens if Russia nukes us in the middle of the night and we're all vaporized and I wake up dead and I'm in hell. I used to be scared of that. I used to lay in my bed at night and I would try to recite the sinner's prayer perfectly, thinking if I can say the words just right, then maybe Jesus will let me in. And I lived in that kind of torment for so long. My mom and dad modeled Christianity for me, but it really was when John Messer gave his life to Christ as a drug dealer and I realized, wow, John has something I don't have. I've got religion. I'm a Baptist, a Presbyterian, and a Pentecostal. I've got religion. But John Messer has a relationship with Jesus. And that's when I understood as much as I could at that point in my life. I've got to deny myself and I've got to embrace what Jesus did for me on the cross. 
Jesus died in your place on the cross. You deserved it. I deserved it. I should have been hanging on that cross, not Jesus. But by God's rich mercy and grace, he took my place. And now he's not dead, he's alive. And I'm not dead in my sin anymore. I'm alive by the grace of God. I'm a new creation and so are you if you are in Christ. But I'm just wondering how many of you today still haven't taken up your cross. Jesus doesn't expect you to die on that cross. He's already taken care of that. You don't have to be crucified. Praise God. Here's what he does expect us to do. He expects us to believe in what he did for us on the cross. So I want to ask every one of you girls and guys right now, in light of what it means to take up your cross, have you ever really truly made your own decision to repent of your sin and trust Christ? Have you ever realized that you are doomed without God and then in humility you ask him to save you? I'm not talking about coming down front in an invitation. That's cool. You can do that, but that doesn't mean you're saved. I went down to probably, I rededicated my life so many times, I didn't even know what, what it meant to be dedicated to Christ. So my invitation for you girls and for you guys this morning is not, a, is not an invitation to recommit. I am not giving a rededication invitation right now. You can rededicate your life to Christ. I, I completely believe in that. If you're a Christian and you want to do that, that's between you and the Lord, and you can do that right now in your seat or wherever you're at or maybe on your own or maybe you've already done that this week. The invitation I want to give right now is a bold invitation for you girls and you guys who don't know Christ, who have been faking it, who have been pretending to be something you're not, or maybe you're just out there kind of wallowing around in confusion. You don't know if you're in his kingdom or out of his kingdom or if you're saved or if you're lost. First John says, you can know that you are a Christian if you have believed. And to believe in Jesus simply means I forsake everything else in this life and I give total control to Christ. I'm his. This is an invitation for you to take up the cross, the one that Jesus died on to save you. So I want you to close your eyes. I want you to open your hearts. Close your eyes and open your hearts. Many of you, probably most of you, are already saved, and I'm glad. A majority of you are probably already a Christian. Thank God for you. But some of you are not, and some of you need to take up your cross right now. The cross that Jesus Christ died on for you is available for your salvation right now. You do not have to leave Momentum. The 75th anniversary of Momentum, you do not have to leave this conference wondering or doubting or fearful or afraid or intimidated or scared about your eternity. Not only can you know that you will go to heaven when you die, but even better than that, you can begin a relationship with Jesus right here, right now, in this life. Your sins can be washed away, the debt can be canceled, and Christ can become your Lord right now, but you've got to respond. So absolute silence in this room. Nobody moving, nobody getting up and walking out. I want your eyes closed, but your heart's open. If this is the moment that the Spirit of God has grabbed your heart, and you know that you need to respond, you need to repent of your sin, you need to give your life to Jesus, and you need to be saved then right where you sit right now, I'm gonna ask you to call on the Lord. Romans 10, 13 says, anyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. So right where you sit right now, with your eyes closed and your heart open, I'm asking you, if you wanna take up your cross, if you wanna embrace Jesus, if you wanna die to your sin in order to live to Christ, right now pray and ask Jesus to save you. I'll lead you in the prayer, but the prayer is not magic. I'm not praying it for you. I'm not a Catholic priest. You've got to pray it. You've got to mean it. You can call on the Lord. You have access to Jesus. Praying a prayer that a preacher asks you to pray doesn't make you a Christian, but confessing your sin does and repenting and believing. So if you want to give your life to Christ, pray right now in your heart. Young or old, adult, 12, 16, volunteer, high school senior, doesn't matter. You can know Christ, you can meet him right now and begin a relationship with him. Pray this to him in your heart if you really wanna know him and be saved. Pray this to him in your heart right now. Jesus, I need you. Rescue me from my sin. 
I give you my life. I give you my future. I give you control. I give you everything. Forgive me of my sin, Jesus. And please save me right now. I'm all yours. And I'm all in. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I embrace the cross. And I receive your love. I'm yours, Jesus. Right now. Total silence in this room. Your eyes closed, your hearts open. I'm going to ask you boldly, clearly, and deliberately. If you just prayed those words to Jesus Christ and you meant what you said, and you just took up the cross, you embraced it, you believed in Jesus for real, I want you right now, quickly, immediately, deliberately, if you just prayed those words to Christ, would you raise your hand straight up above your head and keep it up?